Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Troxel Podcast. I'm Evan Troxel. Just a quick announcement before we get into this one that this is the last episode of 2023. I've got some great episodes in the production pipeline here at Troxel HQ, and I am so looking forward to releasing them. But we'll all have to wait until 2024 to hear them because I'm taking some much needed time off to reset. I plan on spending some quality time with my family get out on the trails on my mountain bike and do some rock climbing. And I hope that you too enjoy the last couple of weeks of 2023. This was a big year for the podcast. I released 34 new episodes this year, which I think is pretty decent considering I moved to a new state. During that time, I also launched a new website and AEC Tech newsletter, which you should definitely go subscribe to at trxl.co and hit one of the subscribe buttons on the page there. I'd like to know your thoughts on the podcast this year, especially what was your favorite episode. You can send me an email at evan at evantroxel.com, or you can get in touch through my feedback form at trxl.co slash feedback. I want to give a special thanks to all of the guests who have come on the show this year. There are way too many to name, but... You can see all of them on my latest website edition at trxl.co slash guests. I also want to thank my partners and sponsors of the podcast this year, who included Randall Stevens and Jim Clifton at Avail and Confluence, Boris Rappaport and Alex Osinenko at ArcIT, Clifton Harness and Laura Passiano at TestFit, and Corey Rubidoux at ArcVision. These are truly incredible people. And I am so grateful to get the chance to work with them and talk about them on this podcast. They really are supporting what I'm doing here. And my deepest gratitude goes out to all of you listeners as we track the coevolution of architecture and technology together. All right. In this episode, I welcome Emil Polson. Emil is an application developer and AEC technology specialist focused on developing tools for the building industry. With a background in architecture, engineering, and software, his goal is to enhance design processes through technology, from concept to implementation. Currently based in Stockholm, Sweden, Emil works remotely for Core Studio at Thornton Tomasetti. He also runs ModelUp, a 3D configurator studio, on a part-time basis. In this episode, we discuss the challenges and opportunities of implementing new technologies in the AEC industry, both internally within a firm, but also externally as products. We delve into the importance of communication, buy-in, and cultural change when introducing new tools and processes, the culture of AEC tech, and the entrepreneurial spirit at TT, Emil's insights from his experience in developing tools and pushing for adoption within a global engineering firm, the benefits of participating in hackathons like the recent 2023 AEC Tech event hosted by Core Studio in New York City, and we talked about his work on web-based 3D configurators for digital products at ModelUp. So without further ado, I bring you Emil Polson. Emil, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you. Thanks, Evan. Pleasure to be here. You are streaming to me from Sweden. I I can't remember if you're the first Swedish guest, but I just had somebody from Norway on. I'm going to hit all the all the Nordic countries here. I hope. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> as long as you don't mention Switzerland, I think you're good because that's okay. the common mix-up, right? I think they they right. they did an IPO of Spotify at Wall Street, you know, and they rolled out the Swiss flag, and everyone Are was like, "Are you serious? What's going on? What? Yeah." <laughs> so it's it's a common mix-up. Yeah, I I've been to Sweden one time. I so so Hovard Vasag was just on the show, and he's oh, yeah. in Oslo, he's in Oslo, and Carl Christensen from Autodesk from Oslo uh, also, I believe, and. Now you're where? Where are you in Sweden? Give us an Stockholm. idea of the geography. Stockholm. Okay, so you're. Capital. I've been to Stockholm one time, and um, nice. I'm my my mother's side of the family is from Finland, and that was mm. kind of the impetus to go to the you know just to go visit. And yeah, so I had to do it all. Had to do all of it for sure. Um, That's but great. absolutely wonderful, wonderful uh, place on earth to go visit for sure. 
Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it's it's a good place, I guess, in many different aspects. Uh, pretty dark um, these these days or this season of the year, you know. This um, season. Yeah. <laughs> but not emotionally. That, <laughs> maybe maybe this maybe this season. But yeah, I was wondering where you were going to go with it when when you. <laughs> no, I, I, I meant actual dark, like yes, you know. Right. I think at the peak around in uh, December, close to Christmas, we have like five hours of sunlight or something like that. So right. you got to charge during the summer. And so you survive the winter. That's how it works. You're at those northern latitudes. Yes, yep. yes, yep. definitely. Uh, I have experienced that. I did not go to Sweden when it was this time of year. I went in the summertime. And uh, so, but I have experienced what you're talking about in Alaska, where mm. the sun just moves kind of horizontally yep. across yep. the horizon. It, you know, it, it it just never goes down part part of the year, and then the other half of the year, like it just never comes up, right? No. <laughs> it's exactly. Like, <laughs> yep. Yep. It's, yep. Yeah, and that is a, a a mind trip for somebody who lives, you know, the lower latitudes, and it's just like, you know. T- the typical structure all day and we can't even get used to a time change right we, we had mm. we just we just had daylight saving time and yeah. even that just throws us off completely it, it it when i see things like that where i can't get used to four weeks at a time one hour difference or another example and this is just a, a super silly example moving the trash can from under the sink from one side to the other and remembering which door to open <laughs> it, it's incredible for me how hard that is to just update my habit of which one to open. It just gives me a lot of pause when I think about change in the AEC industry. <laughs> how hard, how difficult change is when I can't even remember which cabinet door to open, implementing new technologies, implementing new... If, if I can't even remember where the trash is, how am I going to change my business to adopt new technologies to help me do things better and it's i do you ever think of things like that because that that's what goes on in my mind totally for (laughs) sure i mean i think for a long time in the beginning of my career i thought it was all about technology just creating better tools you know more Mm -hmm. efficient tools more efficient processes but really it's a cultural thing isn't it like you got to get the buy-in from the people you work with and i mean if no one really buys in then it's not really much meaning to developing these tools in a way. So um, for sure, I mean, yeah, just like having ev- everyone on board uh, with what you're doing. And I think that's also something that we, we, we do quite a lot in Core Studio. I mean, one one part is obviously developing the technology and the tools, but mm-hmm. um, just having that sort of mechanism to reach out and, and um, yeah, just like connect with people within the company and get their input and really make a, environment where everyone feels involved is, is super important. It's a core attribute of leadership also. And I, I think for those who are in leadership, it feels annoying. But for those who are not in leadership, it's a it's a requirement to understand is that the same message must be repeated over and yeah. over and over, especially when you're going in a new direction, you're charting some new territory, maybe for your office or for your practice or whatever. And it's if you're in leadership, you're, it's like social media. It's like, I don't want to post the same thing even twice. I don't even want to talk about my episodes more than once because I, I have this release schedule of every week. And it's like, okay, that the, I'm done with the other one. I'm on to the new one. This yeah. is very much how it is in practice with projects as well, right? But the idea of repetition to form new habits and make yeah. sure everybody's on the same page. Not everybody yeah. hears the same thing at the same time. Not everybody right. interprets it the same way each time. And, and so why I say it's annoying is because like, it's, I don't want to even hear myself, let alone my peers talk about the same thing over and over and over. But again, like that's the only way things actually change. And so many times we see this with digital practice or IT departments where they, they deploy a new tool onto the firm and nobody uses it. Right. But because there's like this one, like, let's throw it over the wall. And let's just expect adoption, and that never happens. And, never but, works. <laughs> but but we're always in, in that mode. We're always like, because we're onto the next thing and the next yeah. thing, and we need to implement, 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 and we need to see digital transformation, and we need to see the march of change. But if nobody's adopting it, there's no change happening, right? And so then it comes back to this idea of communication and yeah. buy-in, like you're talking about, and and it's like 
because we don't understand marketing, <laughs> we don't understand promotion, mm. we don't understand habit forming to it to its core. Like we we do projects, and we can treat deployments as projects. We can treat mm. new technologies as you know implementations as projects. And we're, we're typically just project minded about it. Okay, yeah. that's done next. That one's done next. It's yeah. very kind of assembly line. But understanding the psychological, the implementation of yeah. different languages and communication styles that different people in different places need to hear because that's yeah. how they will latch on to it best is an art. And yeah, uh, yeah anyway, I, I'm, we're totally digressing here and, and getting away from the point. <laughs> but I, it, these are the kinds of things that I, 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 I love talking about this with, with smart people who have, who have done this. And you're, you're developing at Core Studio, you're developing things for the industry. You're developing tools, I should say, for the industry. And we've always seen a gap between innovation and like deployment of tools and yeah. adoption of tools. And, and you're even coming at it from, you're, you're supporting the industry because you're structural engineers. And it, it's gotta be even harder because you're like, one, from, the, from the architecture side of things, you're one step removed from mm. the, the building. You're, 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 building, you're creating systems for buildings. Yeah. And I would just wonder if communicationally, if that's even a word, how, how do you guys deal with that? How do, how do you, is it through going to conferences and constantly talking about what this technology can deliver, showing it in use, showing how people are using it, that you continue to kind of educate the market on on these new tools? No, for sure. I mean, obviously, that's that's one part. I think it's it's probably a good idea to separate between the kind of internal push and the external push. I mean, I would say mm -hmm. like probably 85% of all the tools we develop is really internal tools. Mm -hmm. And then the um, process gets somewhat easier because, I mean, you're kind of colleagues with your users. So you can always like, you know, walk around the office, tap someone on the shoulder and like, you know, what's up? Is it, is it not working? Like what's, what's going on, et cetera. Right. So, um, but that's a process as well. I mean, as, as, as you were talking about, like it's, it's not going to happen automatically like it, yeah. there has to be some channel of communication and there is has to be some some way of kind of spreading the word um and that can be a challenge for sure because it's always like you know if you look at tech companies like you usually have someone dealing with the like ux someone dealing with the design of a user interface someone actually developing the the front end someone developing the back end someone actually being the product manager you know there is like this huge list of different um um roles really and uh typically what happens at um uh, r&d departments or um you know, computational specialist departments at architecture and engineering offices is that you usually have all these people uh, or like all these roles crammed into a uh, few people. So you, mm -hmm. you, you become sort of a master of kind of handling everything in a way. And that can be quite um, refreshing, I think, because you get to see really like all different uh, aspects of the, of the process. I mean, everything from idea creation to really implementation and then, you know, adoption and just getting that feedback and, and so forth. So... Um, yeah, I think that's that's really, you know, where we do most of our communication, like just like internally deploying the tools and, you know, getting adoption internally. And yeah. I mean, I guess that's also a benefit of having, you know, 1,500 people working in the same company using the tools because, you know, you can test it out. And if, if, if it actually works, you know, um, you can start sketching on the ideas of actually getting it out outside of the company as well. I want to ask a foreshadow. Yeah, I'm going to foreshadow a question. I don't want you to answer right now, but I I want to do this to kind of pre-bookmark a piece of the conversation, <laughs> right. which is, you your your practicing structural engineering office and offices, global presence, and you have decided to productize these internal tools. And I'm sure that there's a whole decision making process about what what's useful internally versus maybe even what you would push out externally. Um, and I don't know how closely those products match, right? Um, but the idea of making that decision to productize and, and deploy software tools, I think is super interesting. Most firms don't do it. If they do, it's kind of, you know, an open source kind of a manner. You're not trying to make it a, a viable income stream necessarily because they're, they're very small piecemeal uh, things. You've figured out how to deploy 
bigger things and put them out there as products. You have to support them. Like you mentioned all the key pieces of of what you're doing. And and I guess, you know, it's the whole idea of what Thornton Thomas City has done with kind of Core Studio, incubating and accelerating other people's ideas, turning them into products, I think is super interesting. Like I said, I don't want to get there yet. I, I want to get there. So that's why I'm bringing it up now <laughs> because it was crossing my mind as, as you're saying all those things. Before we do that, Emil, give us an idea of, of where you're coming from and why you've decided this career path for you. No, for sure. So um, I studied architecture and engineering at Chalmers University here in Sweden. Um, back in, I started back in 2009. I did my bachelor's degree um, three years. So that's really a mix of, you know, pretty kind of typical structural engineering uh, program. Mm. And so that's essentially 50% of the, the program. And then you have the other 50%, which is pretty typical um, in architectural design hmm. projects and, and stuff. So what happens is like you start, maybe not for the first year, maybe like somewhere around like the second year, you start to think about, um, hey, how can I actually apply my skills within design and architecture into structural engineering the way that you, you, know, you hmm. start thinking about engineering problems and vice versa, like, hey, can I actually bring in some of this um, um, engineering concepts into my design projects? And to kind of bridge that, um, the way that I see it, is, it uh, at least, is uh, through competition and, and, and tooling, really, and just like being able to kind of sketch mathematically. That's that's a, it's a pretty interesting concept, I think. Just like mm -hmm. being creative with engineering and math and programming. And I mean, I, I guess I, I I joined the the grasshopper cult quite uh, quite soon in my career, probably. I don't know, 2010 or something like that, and kind of never looked back really. Uh, and that was, I guess, the the gateway drug to getting to heavier stuff. Um, obviously, like some some scripting and, and programming. And um, so yeah, I did that. I took a gap year between my master's and my bachelor, um, and um, moved to the UK where I um, did an internship at Bure Happel. So. Um, that was a great time. I, I worked with some really uh, amazing people and got to work in some really, really interesting problems, um, mainly like, you know, football stadiums and yeah, some bigger um, train station buildings and stuff like that. And, you know, there wasn't really any choice there. Like we had to automate things and processes. And um, I mean, especially if you work for engineering companies, um, one common problem is just like turning geometry into clean stick models that you can analyze right mm. so that's 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 an important topic so um lots of interoperability like just lots of automation in terms of you know really kind of observing how engineers work and how they design components and systems and trying to take their process and you know work with that it's always about context and just understanding how how your colleagues work and you know you can kind of attack the automation um, aspect from 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 that angle. So, um, yeah, kind of did that for a year. Went back to Chalmers where I completed my um, structural engineering masters, and then I continued with my architecture masters. So I have a duo kind of master's degree there. Uh, although I've never actually really officially worked as neither an architect or a structural engineer. I mean, I kind of got into this. Um, um, you know, hybrid, basically, you know, computational design or just um, design technology. Um, so I joined um, TT Core Studio uh, in 2016 and moved to New York, where I lived for two years and kind of started out as a um, kind of developer slash um, computational designer. Uh, just helping out in projects, maybe like 50%, I think it was in the beginning, and then developing tools for the other 50%. But I quite quickly like got into full, full-time development, uh, probably after like half a year or so. And um, yeah, it's 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 great. I think it's just a really fascinating, um, you know, thing to do. Just like being surrounded by all these smart people working on really interesting projects, and just 
be there and help out um, automating tools. And as you kind of mentioned earlier, like Core Studio is um, made up of really two parts. We have the application development team, and then we have the core modeling team. And what usually happens is that the core modeling team, they work with, um, you know, project teams on, on, on projects that are, you know, complicated or geometrically complex. Mm -hmm. And um, when they have seen a pattern in enough projects, like they come to us and we talk about generalizing uh, the, the solution. So that's typically how it works, like just having mm -hmm. that kind of, um, um, you know, back and forth dialogue between the modeling and application development. And obviously the whole company is, is, is quite key for what we do. Going back to your school, the, the idea of a, like an integrated structural engineering and architectural program is really interesting to me because the problem set or maybe the nature of the mind that when it goes after these problems, those are two very different ways of solving problems, right? Like the idea of design being a very wicked problem, unknown unknowns, discovery process, trying to synthesize a multitude of inputs into a solution. Nobody knows what that path is going to be. And as we all experienced in school and studio, <clears throat> we experienced a different solution from every single person, even though it was the same scope of project, right? Engineering, though, is is very different, right? It's, it's kind of reverse engineering that final into like what it actually takes to hold that thing up. I think that that's, that's very interesting from a, from a, like both sides of the brain uh, problem set. I mean, I haven't actually heard of that, at least in the U S of most people go to architecture school or right. they go to engineering school. Is that really what attracted you, or did you just not know which one you preferred, and you kind of figured it out along the way? Like, like where did that come from in you? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, I think I've always been interested in um, design and art, obviously, and, and um, just mathematics and physics and mm -hmm. all that stuff. I, I don't mm -hmm. think I was particularly interested in buildings, to be honest, when I <laughs> when I actually um, I started studying architecture engineering. So uh, yeah, maybe maybe you're right. Maybe it was kind of an open-ended answer to an open-ended question there. Like you know, I, I can postpone my decision a bit more. But um, yeah, yeah, interesting. That that whole world has got to be. I the the idea of going to architecture school and doing really wild designs because you can, right? Because everybody's a designer. <laughs> and then having to have this kind of accountability partner of the structural <laughs> side yeah. of things where I, was that what projects were like? It was, you, they were much more grounded in that sense. Um, yes and no. I mean, you know, we did a lot of projects that just require some amount of you know, structural mechanics um, understanding. Like if you design a bridge, mm. for instance, like it's just part of the design. Like, how is it actually going to work? You know, yeah. think of a suspension bridge, for instance. Like, there, there is a, there is a meaning and there is a, um, an idea of the structural concept. So, um, I think that was really part of the the sketch process, right? Like, you know, you you, you almost like sketch, um, you know, force diagrams and sketch arrows and like, you know, how are we going to support this load, etc. So it's, uh, I kind of agree that it's obviously. Um, different professions with completely like different backgrounds. But um, I kind of like the idea that um, yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean that it's completely different in terms of, sure. uh, you know, procedure, et cetera. Uh, so, um, but no, for sure. I mean, I think I had one project just uh, came to mind now. There was a bridge project and I designed a um, sine wave bridge and it was just like sine waves all over the place. I think I just started to learn grasshopper and like went all in for it. And I think I even went as far as deciding the staircase as a sine uh, wave. And um, like the the teacher told me like, people are gonna die in this staircase. You can't do that. Like, <laughs> so maybe it was clear from that point that I, I wasn't gonna be a good architect anyway, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now I guess Your yeah I was uh, <laughs> no exactly I was just interested in you know tooling and and I guess the process yeah. really um, so yeah. yeah there's definitely something really attractive about that visual programming process and watching the math turn into geometry and yeah. I think 
a lot of times people go into learning a tool like that because they're interested in parametric control over geometry and updating things and 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 playing with things in that sense yeah using using that programming to like you said earlier like you, you talked about sketching with math right like this idea of sketching through visual programming i think is a totally valid concept and a lot of people do that but they don't necessarily think about it as math right they think right. about it as geometric like how you're going to see that geometry in the end and, and being it's able to control that yeah and, but the idea of looking at it like a function looking at it right yeah. because that's kind of that's what it is it's like the first this then this then this and it's it's constantly rippling through until you see the output and if you go back and change something you see the update but thinking about that mathematically i think is really interesting and and people who get into grasshopper start to think like that and it yeah. it definitely that the tool reinforces that and coming when i went to school there was no there was no virtual visual programming there was no uh, it was all just hard modeling right it was all polygon modeling solid yeah. modeling some surface modeling but it was purely geometry right yeah. geometry was my favorite math class <laughs> for sure <laughs> like understanding those concepts actually, and yeah. and it was very visual i think it's definitely a different piece of the mind that operates in that grasshopper space and I think for me, when I got into that eventually, very late, way later than what you're even talking about when you were in school, it was just very much, it was like stretching a new muscle. And I mm -hmm. found that really yeah. intriguing because it was just something that I hadn't experienced before. Uh, and it was a new way of searching for design solutions. And obviously there's a lot of power there, right? To be able to make a small change and watch it ripple throughout is incredibly yeah. empowering as totally. somebody who did not learn how to code did not learn how, and like and, and and it just made it it democratized the ability for me and many others to code in quotes right because i yeah. it is coding but at the same time it, it doesn't feel like coding right so uh <laughs> it, it's really interesting to to think about all that and how it's kind of changed the pursuit of architecture uh, yeah. over the years and and uh, it's kind of an incredible thing to kind of extract out and look at that just that piece of it and what david rutten was was able to accomplish with a totally tool like yeah that. No, for sure yeah. yeah the the idea of of let's get back to to core studio and thornton tomasetti so you you were in new york you said and and is that really where you were introduced to thornton tomasetti and what you're doing yes um Yes and no. I guess you know I, I I was certainly interested in the idea of um, you know computation of design and programming and technology in the AC industry um, before that. But um, yeah, I mean, Thornton Thomas City Core Studio was obviously my my first mm -hmm. real job in a way, right? Okay. So um, I uh, I got to see how things worked in practice for real, and obviously have. Um, learned a lot from just you know being there and working with all these great people. So um, yeah, it was it was an eye opener in many many ways and still is. So so yeah. And and when you were looking for that first job, obviously you have interest in computational design and problem solving. Were you specifically looking for a place to land that that was a core piece of how they did what they did, or what was that decision like for you? Was was it based on that or not? I mean, I think, um, yeah, obviously, like having the um, having the the opportunity to work with processes, I think, was a was a key component in this. Um, and um, I mean, Core Studio is really just research and kind of developing tools for for the practice, right? So. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of was interested in pursuing um, a career in academia um, early on as well. But at the same time, it's just a pretty awesome thing to just be around real projects solving real yeah. problems. So I think yeah. I think that was certainly something that I that I was uh, interested in. And um, I mean, I heard about uh, Core Studio for for um, uh, yeah long before I joined. So um, it was kind of a known known um, um, uh, figure in the industry, obviously. And then I had a friend who had um, done an internship 
a year prior. So she kind of connected me and uh, yeah, um, I was lucky to to get involved. I, I'm thinking back to the first time that I think that I heard about Core Studio, which I, I again would probably not be early days for Core Studio at all, but just my awareness of it uh, was when, and I mentioned this to you a minute ago, but Daniel C. Graves was presenting mm -hmm. at a USC BIMBOP many years ago, probably around 2016 or so. Yeah. Uh, and he was talking about Asterisk as one of your new tools in development. And it was kind of a preview of, of the kinds of projects that you were working on. And that was the first time that I think I ever was introduced to the idea of a practice, structural engineering practice, let alone architectural practice or whatever, product starting to productize or thinking about an internal tool being used outside of their practice. And I thought that was fascinating. And it was all done through the web. And I think yeah. there was maybe some grasshopper components that went along with it to connect those things together. Yeah. <clears throat> and that to me was was kind of eye-opening at that point. And that to me showed the seriousness of Core Studio really being this thing inside of a larger <laughs> practice because it really when it's all tied to projects when when the the core functionality of a thing like that inside it, if you think about it as this group of people and they're just supporting projects the projects rule everything right so mm -hmm. to there it seemed to me like there had to be and I didn't get to ask him this but there has to be this layer of i don't know isolation not isolation but 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 separation from the projects and and you guys said you kind of do two things you you support the practice but you also work on these products and you, and you even work on the pro products first they're they're mm -hmm. driven out of the yeah. needs and the, the patterns that are being yeah. seen by the practice can you talk about that because your group is not it's not huge but it's i mean you're you're kind of standalone right like i don't know you have how many people are in your I in your group 20 plus I was gonna say um, twenty, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Okay. So no, for sure. I mean, that's that's always the the dream, right? Like you you work on tools, and you can build it to a project, and you know, client pays for the the development, and everyone is happy. But yeah, it doesn't really work that way uh, because you know projects have deadlines and they have priorities, right. and you know. Uh, so I think I think that's an important aspect. Like if you actually want to get serious with. Um, you know, tool development, it yeah. sort of has to be outside of the, the project work. Um, as you said, like, obviously you can still be informed and it can be very much uh, a nice accelerator, just like testing out the tools and kind of getting feedback and, um, yeah. you know, push the development forward. But um, developing You have a built-in built in beta audience, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. have that pool. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, I would also separate between you know, scripting and tool development. Those mm -hmm, are two different mm -hmm. things. Like mm -hmm. using using computational um, design tools to um, accelerate projects. I mean, it's kind of a way of modeling, I would say. Yeah. But if you actually want to go into developing robust tools, you know, it's going to need documentation. It's going to need testing. It's going to need like all these things that just get very hard to do within the, the scope of a project. Um, so... So yeah, I mean, I think yeah, we're very lucky to have that environment in in uh, Thornton Thomas uh, Thornton Thomas City, and just being able to um, work on these projects uh, and uh, and tools. It just seems very prescient, I guess. I don't know the right word, but the idea of TT investing in this yeah. smaller entity within the larger firm, obviously, like you said, you get to. It's, it's a great place to be because you have the resources of this very large firm and you have this layer of separation in that I, I would assume like the, the leadership of Core Studio making decisions about products, about which direction to go. Uh, and, and then also like TT gets to brag about Core Studio, right? Like it's this really cool thing that they do, that they are pushing they're constantly on the bleeding edge of, of yeah. what they're doing, and that positions TT yeah. in a different segment of the market. I mean, there's there's other firms doing similar things, right? But but this to me was kind of like again the first time I had seen that, and yeah. and so like the idea of having an innovation incubator inside yeah. of a firm that operates 
semi-independently under the umbrella of TT and having that, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a useful relationship in both directions, obviously. Uh, that, that to me is just something that more people need to think about, right? Because yeah. when, when you're, when you have a team in house, like you said earlier, that just support that does scripting, that just supports prod projects, and are constantly helping those teams hit their deadlines or, or whatever, that is a very different thing than product development. Yes. Right. Yes. And yes. and it takes a different approach. It yeah. takes a different skill set. There's, and so, I guess what I'm saying is like you can't you can't decide to do it like you guys have done it and and have it fully integrated and oh. because it's just that would just be something entirely different a lot of firms are doing that in fact yeah. right and, and but but this is this is unique er <laughs> than <laughs> what most fee, most most firms do and i don't i don't know really know where i'm going with that but i just i observe observations things oh, that totally. i've been thinking about as as i've watched tt and core studio kind of the way that you guys talk about the the work that you do outwardly is is yeah, really yeah. interesting no, for sure. I mean, as you said, like I think Core Studio plays an important role in the, you know, presentation of of, of TT as well as you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just being able to show, um, you know, all the tools that we develop and all the, um, you know, routines and, and automation scripts and everything like that, um, like our partners get access to if they work with us is a pretty strong motivation and you know pretty good sales pitch so so for sure i mean it's um yeah yeah core studio is, is um is uh has a good presence on on the company slides so to speak yeah. like it, you right. know it's uh got to think about the presentation for sure talk about some of the products that you have developed so i know about constru and mm -hmm. asterisk and I'm, I'm sure there are others but those are the ones that kind of pop to my mind immediately can you just talk about the types of things that you are productizing and putting out and making available to others to use and 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 why you've decided to to make those tools available i mean obviously there's an advantage to you guys where if you are working on a project with an architectural firm say yeah. and they're using those tools to talk to you yeah. but but beyond that i mean i i kind of assume there's also this this ability for people to just use that tool and you you're just applying mm. you build the tool people push something in they get something back out they can use it i mean talk about about that because that to me is very different than a traditional consultant relationship on yeah. a larger design team no for sure i mean i think um don't quote me on it but i think the first public tool we made was the um tt toolbox plugin for grasshopper right uh, which is yeah i don't know how many thousands thousands of downloads it has but quite a lot and that's really just like a good mix of different, you know, grasshopper um, components that we thought were good to have, really. Um, mm. So I don't know when that was released, probably back in like 2013 or 14, maybe. I'll have to look that up on Food for Rhino. I'm, there's there's probably a history of, of that. Yeah, for there. sure. We, we actually made a new release like a year ago, something like that. Um, um, yeah, just updating some 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 good good stuff, just throwing some, some, some more goodies there. Um, but I think, yeah, um, you know, there is certainly um, kind of a marketing component to this, right? Like you um, deploy these tools for free, mm -hmm. like people mm -hmm. get to use it. Uh, maybe that was actually how I actually got familiar with um, mm. TT and Core Studio in the first place, actually, thinking about it. Uh, so That makes sense, um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's one aspect, just like getting, getting the tools out there, getting people to use them. You know, kind of build up that community. I guess um, the AC Tech Conference is probably something we can chat about later as well. But it's it's very much about just like building up that community and you know um, getting partners and 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 um, uh, get to know people in the industry, obviously. And um, yeah, after that, I think Construe was probably the second product that we launched outside of um, um, TT. I mean, from the Core Studio perspective, uh, there is another. Um, component of of TT that do more kind of scientific tooling, and they they have a pretty strong background in this this kind of tool development. Uh, but from the Core Studio side, um, I would say Construe, which is really just the interoperability platform, uh, and that was also its its 
it existed in a different format. Uh, in the beginning, it was way more kind of desktop based, like you would mm. save your you know, geometry database into a file, you could send this file around or place it on a, a network drive somewhere. Um, and then back in 2015-ish, um, we started to build a cloud solution for it. And um, yeah, I mean, as, as we've talked about, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a good opportunity to really test out the, the tools and ideas and, um, you know, prototyping internally and then kind of test the waters um, outside of the company. Um, so, but yeah, since then, I mean, yes, yeah, asterisk, as we, as we talked about, it's a, it's a, a really a structural optioneering tool. Like the idea is mm -hmm. as, as um, you as an architect or, you know, if you're in a project, early stage project, like from amassing, uh, mm -hmm. Can you generate a structural wireframing such that you can make some early guesses about, you know, how much is this going to cost? Like, what's going to be the embodied carbon? Uh, all these like early decisions um, about the building system. Um, so, um, yeah, I was involved in that project uh, mainly on the geometry side. Like, given this massing geometry, um, how do we actually generate a structural wireframing that we can use for different um, for different things? Um, so I think that was probably the first time that I really started to work with the um, the Rhino Common uh, Rhino API, mm -hmm. which is a uh, um, fantastic API. It just has the perfect level of um, abstraction for me as a, a you know computational person really just like understanding, you know, uh, not having to, um, you know, revisit mathematics from from some engineering class, but just like, okay, I have this plane, I want to intersect it with this mesh, like, how do I do it? Um, yeah. So yeah, we really built the whole um, geometry engine using Rhino Common. And this was pre Rhino Compute, which um, I think was released back in 2018 or something like that. Yeah, so we had a pretty right. interesting ad hoc solution to actually being able to put that on a server, because that was the right. idea. Like you had a, the the web application, and you would, you know, provide your your um, uh, inputs of the massing, and um, then you can you know toggle different inputs and really see um, you know a, a visualization of the the structural model, but also you know some um, quantitative outputs like you know um what's the tonnage um yeah how right. much how much it's going to cost etc i remember that and when you said optioneering it made me think about how you're doing optioneering and it was like you, you could choose different structural types right i mean as an example it, was, it wasn't like you were spitting out a thousand generative steel structures for that mass it was like you, you had a, a few different types to choose from and then like you said you you start to quantify it and you also start you could put numbers to it that yeah. for cost or things like that to give you I, the whole idea of this tool was to get to inform a designer yes. at least give them something to base a conversation on when they're exactly. talking about how they how they're going to make decisions to move forward so yeah. which which structural system and why the earlier I can get that information plugged into my mass, which is yeah. just super basic, actual yeah. blobby mass, right? And, and start to see what that structure could look like inside of there uh, is, I think, was was incredible. It's, it's just, it, it gives a designer superpowers because they know more than any other architect would about, about that, right? Because if they're using a tool like that, they just have more information to work with no, earlier, yeah, exactly. which helps them make better decisions. No, for sure. Exactly. I, th I think I think that's right. It's really about like what's what's the information and how much do you get at, cer at a certain stage in a project, and you know it's it's always hard like how much control do you actually provide here. Uh, so that was something that we um, mm. thought about a lot. Like, you know, is it enough just providing some distance for the um, um, you know base sizes here, or should we? really allow the user to provide grid lines um, and um, you know to what level of detail do we specify the structural framing like should we separate between the floors and the columns and the you know um, yeah beam systems like yeah there are just tons of different options there and, and it's it's um, you know some somewhere you got to make a decision like okay we, we will support this but we'll wait for this until yeah. someone asks for it kind of sky's the limit when it comes to development until it until you actually have to 
have people do it, right? So I'm yeah. sure the ideas were plentiful, but what you actually decided to ship in those first iterations of that product had to be scaled back to kind of like the yeah the least, right? It had to be to what is the how can this add value, but also yeah. like let again let let's go through this iterative process of yeah. deploying a tool over time. This we're going to play the long game with a tool like this. We're not going to try to cram it all into a version one release. And then see what people think about it. So, did you get a lot of feedback from firms about the kinds of things that would be more useful to them over time, or and, and these things were already on your list, and you're like, "Yep, yep, that's potentially on the roadmap." <laughs> or, or, or were you actually hearing new ideas that you guys had never thought of? No, for sure, we, we heard um, we heard a lot of interesting ideas as as early feedback. But also, you know, going back to the discussion about like how much control do you actually provide i think we made some pretty crude uh, assumptions about grid lines like you know um our idea was like okay we're probably going to be better at guessing um i mean grid lines is a big thing in structural engineering like you essentially have a yep. massing right and then you know you 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 place grid lines and in those intersections you place columns and then you kind of work work from the system upwards um and yeah, that was one of the things that we kind of assumed that we would know better than the user, which turned out to be kind of wrong, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, so then we started to experimenting with, with <laughs> I'm other... just laughing because <laughs> I I remember moving grid lines like an in, in inch <laughs> yeah. or two, yeah. right all the time. And, yeah, exactly. and the engineer would be pissed, right? But it was always <laughs> yeah. like, well, here's why. And and yeah. and you you talk through it and okay, everybody's okay, yep, you're we should do that or we shouldn't do that, here's why. But but to your point, like can it's not an easy thing to just guess where those. No, exactly, and you know, it's it's always like, um, I mean, sometimes if you have um, buildings that aren't completely extruded, you're going to end up with some additional uh, grid mm -hmm. lines that are not mm -hmm. present on the you know, ground floor. So right. it got just more and more complicated until we decided yeah, to actually, I hey, bet. maybe we actually need some kind of editing functionality of the grid lines there. Um, so, uh, but we do actually have a Rhino plugin for um, Asterisk as well, which kind of allows you to, you know, edit the the, the massing inside of Rhino and sort of have the system, you know, compute, uh, compute it really uh, real time. So, um, so that's computing uh, it locally on on the user's machine. No, it's not. Okay. So that was a that was a um, decision we made to kind of keep the geometry engine uh, remote. Because uh, the idea was like, okay, you, you use Rhino and the modeling tools in Rhino to kind of author your massing, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can essentially upload it uh, to the system. Um, and um, you can still like have Rhino running and edit it. We even had like a live sculpt mode, which would kind of react to um, everything you made in Rhino, like all the changes to the, to the massing. Um, but the idea was to kind of still have the ability to make it available without Rhino, so to speak. Mm, okay. um, so, um, so yeah. And then, of course, like just being able to kind of see all the different um, uh, configurations in some diagram, which was obviously inspired by um, a hackathon project we, um, I think, was developed in an ASC tech probably 2015 or something like that called um, Design something. Yeah, um, Design Explorer. That's it. Mm -hmm. uh, so really this kind of parallel diagram of like, you know, different um, permutations of parameters just like visualized in a right. intuitive fashion, uh, which nice. actually took off and became another product that we've worked on called Thread, which right. is really about kind of um, exploring data and uh, yeah, BIM data and structural data and um, yeah, different data associated with geometry, really. Um, so that's a big thing also in structural engineering. Like you have this um, you know, base model, like some base geometry. And then if you run structural analysis on it, it's going to have a lot of metadata about yeah, engineering performance. And that can be a lot, like a lot of data, gigabytes of data sometimes. Mm. And that can be quite hard to um, get an overview of or just like understand the data. Uh, so uh, I would say big parts of what we do has to do with um, just visualizing data in a meaningful mm -hmm. way. Yeah. Let's talk about naming for a second. So this is not a, a meaty part of the conversation, but uh, I think TT Toolbox was probably one of the default kind of 
packages that everybody downloaded at some point, right? There's like Lunchbox, TT Toolbox, <laughs> Human UI. There, there's a few of them, right? And um, totally an engineer's name. Like you guys didn't even come up with a good <laughs> animal. <laughs> yeah, <not> exactly. <laughs> to, to name it. <laughs> I mean, good That's branding true. for for Thornton Tomasetti, but uh, but not in line with with all the other uh, animal names. So well, you get one demerit <laughs> for that. But then the idea of asterisk. Where, where's the name for asterisk come from? Do you know? Yeah, I know exactly where it's coming from. It was like, um, you know, we had some early prototypes, and we just talked about how do we deal with. Um, potentially solutions that aren't good. Uh, and uh, Rob, my boss at uh, Thornton Thomas City, uh, or Core Studio, he, he proposed like, hey, maybe we should just put an asterisk under the whole thing, just saying like, hey, you know, be careful. So that's where it disclaimer. came from. Disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, it's a disclaimer. <laughs> it's a disclaimer. That's great. That, I kind of wondered if that, if that's what it was because, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like, yeah, take, take exactly. this with a grain of salt kind of Pretty a much. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, we can't be held liable. I think that's that's an interesting idea about kind of governance of of this solution, right? Which is like use this at your own risk because these conversations have come up over the years. Which is like, well, well, what if we make a tool and then somebody makes a decision based on yeah. that tool that leads to a bad outcome? Who's liable for that, right? And so then, yeah, you do have to have the legalese attached to every single thing that you put out into the world in this realm, which is like. Uh, you know, use this at your own risk because there's no guarantees. All of these things that you read in the, yeah. in the license agreements, right? Exactly. Um, exactly. Is that something? I mean, with that, I'm assume that was a major conversation piece as you guys went into this. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. And I think you know, always when you work on tools like design tools that are, um, I mean, the whole idea is to use it in early stages, right? So there is mm -hmm. always like a pretty low resolution of inputs coming in, like a massing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's just like you got to be careful about that really, like, you know, low resolution right. in, kind of roll it, low resolution out. So I think our, you know, idea of just naming it asterisk was really that, like, okay, there is going to be low resolution here. Yeah. But probably... So much so that you named your product, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but hopefully enough to to make those early decisions, you know, should we go for timber? Should we like have a right. composite beam system here? Should we like go with this um, foundation system, et cetera? Just like this, um, you know, high level questions. Helping people make those decisions earlier. Yeah. Right. I, and, and now we live in a world where, I mean, the AI stuff is, is a headline yeah. a few days a week, right? And talking about this idea of hallucinations, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> asterisk could be hallucinating as well. We didn't call it that back <laughs> right. then, right? Yeah. But that that's the idea is like, we don't know every bit of context about your project. We don't, we, we only know what you gave us. And from there, we had to dissect that mathematically to turn it into bays, into a structural system, yeah. to size beams. I don't know if there's location data included in there or not to kind of give, you know, different regions have different codes and I mean there's a there's a mess of of a AEC world out there when it comes to all of that stuff and so yeah. being able to custom tailor a solution is definitely a very different process than what you're yeah. offering here in the beginning but it can help people make those decisions early yeah. and uh, those could be hallucinations right like, <laughs> and, and and we hear we hear disclaimers all the time now it's like double check double check double check all of this because what it's spitting out may not be yeah. even true right yeah. uh, okay Yep. I guess that's something that the onus is on us as users to constantly be reminding ourselves to do that. Totally. No, for sure. And actually, um, funny enough, you know, um, there is an, a machine learning component to Asterisk uh, on a uh, component level. So we have a big library called Core Structure, which is really um, just tons of... Um, you know, engineering equations and design, um, like structural engineering uh, design routines uh, that has been developed for, yeah, many years. And, you know, the idea is really that, like, it's kind of the the, um, the entire mind of TT kind of in this code yeah. base in a way. And, encapsulated, um, right. Encapsulated in the code base, exactly. And, and cool. um, yeah, and it works well. Um, but, I mean, if you're designing thousands of beams and thousands of columns like there is a performance aspect to it and you know if if you um if you're developing these like early stage rapid prototyping tools you know it's um it has to be performance and um 
uh, just having that playfulness is extremely important. And that's that was something that we realized. You don't want to, you know, press a button and then, you know, wait for an hour to get some results. So mm-hmm. that was one mm-hmm. of the motives to actually look into um, uh, just machine learning. Like, hey, we have these equations. Can we just like throw in a bunch of inputs here, get some outputs out, and then train a model to essentially learn how to size beams and columns. Um, and um, yeah, so when you do that, you get results within, you know, a millisecond or something. So wow. um, so that's um, that was something that we actually started out doing like back in 2016, 17 as well. So um, yeah, we, we have been on the machine learning track for, for quite some time. Obviously now it's really started to take off the whole AI discussion mm. as well. And uh, we had some ideas of, of how to, you know, start implementing some of that in, in the um, wireframing logic as well, like the structural wireframing logic, but um, never really got there. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a super interesting, um, mm-hmm. um, you know, side of our industry to, to observe these days. I think just like the whole, um, yeah, discussion about the yeah. AI and how, how things will change and, you know, I'm sure. So, so let's use this as a segue into AEC tech and hackathons and and things like that. Because getting outside of your walls again, this is something that's important. I I assume for you guys uh, to infuse, like, not only expose that culture to others who are not part of Core Studio and and TT. There's this is kind of like an academic tie-in, right? It's like (laughs) this is like being in a design studio, right? It's like let's do this really intensive project based you define the project but then you 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 assemble a team you you go after doing something and but i'm sure that like the way that those dots get connected and the way those neurons fire in that environment is just invigorating for <laughs> for you and i'm sure that that you at core studio get a lot of value out of putting those events on and you're also contributing and participating in those events at the kind of user level as well on teams right you guys had a, a recent project rhino anywhere right so i let's let's just chat about this this general area from the high level all the way to working on a team and producing a a, a new idea and 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 putting a kind of proof of concept together and putting it out there let's start at the high level from a value proposition of putting on hackathons the whole AEC tech thing. Give us yeah. an overview of kind of where where you stand in, in that whole thing. No, for sure. I mean, we've been running the AEC tech event for more than a decade now, actually. Wow. Yeah. And um, it's really composed of, um, I guess, three things. Like, first of all, you have the workshops is, you know, where we essentially invite people to teach things. I mean, it, mm-hmm. you usually have some folks from from um, McNeil, you know, uh, the folks from Ladybug Tools, usually there. Hypar has been there. Um, and um, it's just a fantastic opportunity to get this um, really innovative people uh, just like showcasing their stuff and like just showing, hey, this is a tool that we've been working on or a feature that we've been working on. Um, and um, yeah, just get that kind of one-to-one connection with the, the actual mm-hmm. author of the tool is just amazing. Uh, so that's one component. Then we have like virtual versions of that as well. Um, obviously, something that got you know more and more important during the the COVID times, and we've kind of stuck with that since then. Um, and then we have the symposium, which is the um, yeah, just like keynote speakers. We invite you know interesting people, mm-hmm. um, and you know they present their stuff. Um, and um, finally, which is obviously my favorite portion, is the hackathon, uh, where uh, you know people get together. Um, so it starts out with the lightning round. So it's usually around you know ten in the morning, something like that. You get a cup of coffee, and uh, the pitches start. Um, so you, if you have an idea, I mean, there isn't a microphone. That's why it's called the, the lightning rounds. Like you just present maybe one two minutes, just present an idea. Uh, and um, if either if you have something yourself you want to present, you can do that or just like sit back, listen in to other people's ideas. Um, and then there is a group formation um, process where, you know, people just like, yeah, meet and greet kind of and, and get together and um, start talking about, uh, you know, the hack projects and 
then you have 24 hours to actually produce something out of it. And yeah, it's just a fantastic format to get things done in a way. Uh, Because there really isn't that much time to, you know, reflect on different trajectories or like, you know, should we do X or Y? It's got to be pretty fast. And that's, uh, I think that's a fascinating Mm -hmm. um, aspect of an industry that's otherwise quite slow, right? And thinking about like how how long it takes to to build buildings and design buildings. uh, so yeah, I mean it's it's you know we we host it yearly in in New York and um, um, yeah we kind of built up a pretty good community around it now. So we have a Slack channel you know where people can uh, can communicate throughout the year and um, yeah it's 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 just fun. Like there are a lot of new people showing up every year and there are a good group of like core people that always like show up and, and it's actually growing pretty good for, for, um, for every year now. And I think we had like, was it 16, uh, hackathon projects, um, wow. yeah. presented last time now. Uh, and I think it was even 30 plus, um, presentations in the, uh, lightning rounds and yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of picking up speed and it's, it's all about like building that community and kind of, you know, discuss problems we have, um, you know, within the companies, like how can we get together and solve it, and you know, learn from each other and so forth. So it's 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 a fantastic event, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm really glad we have all those three components because they really get together pretty pretty well. It's interesting to think about how it's I, over a decade. It's probably shifted quite a bit from workflows to product yeah. that that is potential, right? These are put sixteen potential products could come out of a hackathon versus. A decade ago, it was like, how do I get this stuff from here to there, <laughs> right? No, for and, sure. And I, I think that that's, that's pretty fascinating because of startup culture, venture capital, um, just ev- everything's a pitch deck nowadays and people have ideas, you know, there's no end to them. So I think that's really interesting. And I wonder, like people who go into this, they've been incubating, I assume, these ideas maybe for a little while at least, and they're presenting them like they're they're probably less on the fly inspiration from that conference but it's like somebody's had this idea they've been kicking around in their head for a while i'm going to say it out loud <laughs> and see who else here is yeah. interested and then i also wonder if there's some because i haven't been to this event is there positioning of in this presentation because you kind of suss out the different pieces teammates skills that they bring to the table and is there kind of like this this I, you, I, I really need you on my team because you're the you're the <laughs> web GL team. guy or whatever. <laughs> is that is all is all that happening as well on kind of behind uh, the scenes? Informally, yes, I would say, but there is no list of competencies that a specific hackathon project uh, yeah. needs or anything like that. It's it's more organic, yeah. I would say, and sometimes you get a you get up there, you pitch, and then you start talking with some people, and then this idea. Uh, turns into something completely different like it's yes. uh you know it's 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 quite fascinating just like having that sort of platform to you know you, you plant a seed and then it becomes something completely different from what you thought initially and actually you know I, I think i think there is a good mix of people you know thinking about problems like being really prepared for this hackathon and other people that are just like hey okay maybe just come up with something like one minute before the lightning round. So um, that was actually the case for um, the Rhino Anywhere project that I was involved in uh, hacking on, which is really a kind of a, um, yeah, kind of a web client for 3D uh, modeling using Rhino, uh, using um, stream uh, pixel streaming uh, technology. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, myself and my colleague, Sergey, we kind of discussed uh, different ways to get... Um, um, like Rhino more interactive. We were thinking about hooking up Galapagos, the um, gener- uh, genetic solver with um, like Rhino Compute and uh, Rest Hopper, which was actually another hackathon project um, a few years ago. Uh, but then, yeah, we started to talk about like, hey, could we actually build something using pixel streaming instead? That would actually, you know, just like stream the viewport to, to a browser and uh, yeah, that was sort of an idea that just came up like a few minutes before the the pitches. So yeah, I think it's a good mix of um, you know people having actual problems that they have encountered in their daily um, you know um, daily work, 
um, they actually really want to solve. And then, you know, some people that just want to like mess around with some new technologies or like think about different ways of doing things and, and such. There's been some incredible projects and obviously we don't have time to go through them all, but as some, maybe, maybe a couple of examples, but I want you to land on Rhino anywhere because it's, I'm sure it's like, it's still right there in the forefront of your mind and, and maybe it even has some legs to go somewhere. Um, give, give some examples of the kinds of projects that have come out of AEC tech hackathons. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's interesting because you always see a theme for every year. You know, mm. I think back in like 16, 17, it was all about like interoperability. Like, hey, can I turn this Revit model mm. into, you know, this Tecla model or, um, you know, whatever. Um, and then there was another year where it was like, okay, I have this 3D geometry. Now I want to visualize it in a browser. Can we do that? Um, uh, we have one year... I think it was probably when the uh, Rhino Compute and Rhino Inside stuff was released and everyone just put Rhino inside of other processes and was like everything. Rhino Inside. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rhino <laughs> Inside everything. Uh, can you guess what the theme for, for this year was? No, not at all. I can't guess the two letters that this one was about. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. No idea. Never. Yeah. Nope. No, nope, not not <laughs> no. gonna go for it. Not I'm not taking your bait right there. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. But yeah, there were a lot of interesting like ChatGPT um, yeah. uh, versions. Like someone built a really uh, cool um, Clippy. You remember Clippy from from yeah, the old of Windows? Yeah. So it looks like you're trying to write a business letter, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so someone made a Clippy for Reddit, uh, and that was quite interesting to to see. It was pretty pretty impressive like you you typed in so let's say you have a revit model open up uh and you say hey you know delete the beams on the top floor or something like that so what the system would do it would pick up the prompt it would generate some code using the revit api compile it and then execute it essentially wow. Wow. so um sounds really dangerous <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that, 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 sh that should have been called asterisk, probably. You mean you mean anyone can go into my model and delete <laughs> yeah. stuff yeah. At, in, in mass, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. That was kind of part of the presentation as well. Like, you know, major, major warning. Like, this is going to mess your uh, Revit model up. <laughs> right. You might want to uh, back up first. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I the the whole yeah. I mean, my my I, my not taking the bait uh, to say it was about AI was uh, you know. <laughs> I hope hope that landed. But the the idea of of Chat GPT as a really good interface. I mean, the idea of text prompting to do things does democratize tools to a certain extent. That that is absolutely incredible, right? To to give anybody the ability, I mean, whether it's successful or not, to be able to type something in in natural language versus find a tool, learn how to use it, apply it. Like, those are two different worlds. And to make it easier for people to make architecture, make structural models, do all those things, I think is, I mean, there's definitely something there there. No, for sure. I am also super interested in that. Um, and um, I mean, as I said, like it, it's um, you can even apply it on, you know, software development. Like you're you're getting into some new library or like some new I don't know SDK that you know nothing about. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's, the Matrix, right? This is when yeah. Neo says, "I I know kung fu." All of a sudden, <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's it's kind of like that. I mean, it's our our ignorance has has <laughs> us putting those projects off, learning those things. Is, is now maybe turned into an advantage because I don't have to learn those things. I think exactly. that's really, that is really interesting. And with great power comes great responsibility, yeah. right? If, if you literally can type, delete the structure from the top floor, like that's, you're giving somebody great power and also great responsibility when, when all these projects have so many stakeholders, so yeah. many team people working in the models at the same time. And it's like, you did what, right? It's no <laughs> longer just like, I need you to sync to central. It's like, I need you to run all your prompts by me first, kind of a thing. Yeah. No, for sure. Absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, no, it, it's really fascinating. I mean, I think especially with, um, I'm really interested in the combination of, you know, parametric design and kind of natural language. I mean, the idea of kind of having some sort of configurator or um, parametric model and 
using a prompt. It's all about like getting the GPTs to create that glue code, right? Like you have the natural language mm -hmm. here, you have the mm -hmm. configurator or some system here. Mm -hmm. Like, can the GPT figure out the glue between? Um, and um, yeah, that's fascinating because then you can yeah get the GPT to to write um, Revit um, code or like code using the the Revit API or you know or get Python. the GPT yeah. to actually yeah or Python or just like hey these are my parameters like uh, I want to create uh, an L shaped building with this type of roof um, you know here is the schema for for all the parameters go uh, so um, yeah it's 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 fascinating to to see how things uh, evolve there and we're seeing high park do that right yeah where it's like describing a podium building in an l yeah. shape with 10 stories above it yeah. and and it's it is gener it's it thinks about it and then there it is in full 3d and it, is it exactly what you want maybe not <laughs> right no. probably not but at the same time like uh that took 10 seconds like that from from just writing a sentence and and maybe editing that sentence to get something a little bit different is a, an amazing starting point yeah. <clears throat> and it goes back to the idea that ian talked about in the very beginning which is why do we always start with a blank page why are we yeah. forced to start with a blank page i mean this is a this is a super shortcut right to to having something to bounce ideas off of yeah uh, it was just through writing natural language i think it's absolutely incredible and it's a paradigm shift for the way we approach what we do i mean and mm -hmm. and what like you're you're talking about core studio we have ideas for ai right like this mm -hmm. this wasn't a thing in aec five years ago like this idea of using it as a tool to to make stuff let alone mm -hmm you know, some of its other amazing uses to uh, qu basically to categorize things automatically based on shapes and locations in room. Like we, we see it in so many different ways. Like there's putting, adding structure to our unstructured data, like using computer vision to pick things out mm. of a, yeah. of a, an image and, and tell us what, what's in there. I think it's absolutely incredible to see all these things come together. And for us to ignore that is crazy to me. If, mm -hmm. if firms are actively choosing to ignore that, I think it's crazy because like this, the way that I used to talk about digital practice when I was running the digital practice team in our firm was like, we call it digital practice. Mm -hmm. We're gonna just, it's just gonna be practice at some point. <laughs> like everybody needs to think yeah. like, and so this is another level of that. This is like, yeah. we call it AI. We're, it's just gonna be in everything and you're not gonna, it's, yeah. you're not gonna be able to distinguish it as this other thing pretty soon right it's just going to be and it already is in so many things and we just don't label it under that label but it we see it all the time right in in so many things that we do so yeah. uh for pe people to ignore it i think is is kind of foolish at this point because oh, sure. it is a paradigm shift it will change the way yeah. that we approach or it already has changed the way that we approach doing what we do no for sure and i mean i think it's easy to laugh at it now like looking at some I don't know, pictures, uh, like AI generated pictures with some deformed hands or something like that. And, but, you know, I think it's just a matter of time, really. Like it's getting, we're so good at picking out those stupid little yeah. things and focusing <laughs> on that when, when yeah. the bigger picture is yeah. like, that was magic. Like yeah. that you have to, uh, we all have to acknowledge that that was magic, right? That totally. it's, it's that kind of a thing. It's like it, I, and I've told this story before, so, so forgive me, audience, but I, don't, I haven't talked about this with Emil, but it's this idea of 3D printing, right? And, and it's working all night building this model for you on your behalf. Like, yeah. yes, you have to babysit it a little bit because you don't want spaghetti, right? But at the same time, like, so, so the, the interaction I had with a senior architect was like, well, why does it take so long? I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> that is literally magic. Like, and it does it while you're sleeping. What do you yeah. mean, why does it take so long? Right? Like, again, missing the, the forest for the trees. It's like, mm -hmm. I think it's similar with this AI thing. It's like, look at what's going on. Big picture. This is, this is a, a new era. I mean, I, and I hate to say it because it, you see that all over the place. It is, this is the next iPhone moment, whatever those things <laughs> are like, this is a, this is a paradigm shift. And it, and the reason I say that is because it, it, when was it? It was 2017. I was doing a tech conference in our firm and it's like, think back 10 years, 10 years ago, did anybody think that every single person was going to basically have a supercomputer in their pocket? Right. 10 years. That was just mm -hmm. 10 years. Right. Yeah. 
And nobody could raise their hand and say, yes, I totally saw that coming. Nobody, right? Um, I think it's it, this is kind of like that. It's like, what is this going to look like in the next five years? What is this going to look like in the next 10 years? It's going to be undistinguishable from all of the, it's going to be tied into absolutely everything. Yeah. For good or for worse, no, for better or for worse. I mean, there's, you know. No, for sure. I I think I had a similar aha moment um, when I used um, ChatGPT for the first time and you realize this, this is not a chatbot. This is a brain. Like, mm, I think mm -hmm. just like understanding that it's it's not necessarily the interface of me chatting. Like this is a, this is a brain that's automated, that sits on a server and just do stuff. Um, yeah, and just like having having that tool in the pocket, like deploying brains for different processes, it's just um, yeah, mind blowing. I think second brain, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so let's talk about Rhino Anywhere. Uh, we still have a couple topics that I want to get to here. So let's talk about Rhino Anywhere and this idea of uh, putting Rhino basically into a web browser where you have direct modeling capabilities. You're using fancy terms like pixel streaming going on, and, and so just. Break that down for, for people who don't know what that is and, and what was interesting to you about chasing after this project. No, for sure. I mean, I think, um, you know, modeling is hard. Like 3D modeling is hard, and it's even harder to build good systems that do 3D modeling. Um, and, you know, that's why you have people like McNeil that have been developing Rhino for, you know, decades 25 and, years. They just had their 25th oh, five-year anniversary, wow. right? <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. So it takes time. And, you know, you can you can probably build something simple for drawing, you know, a line starting from point A to point B. But, like, if you actually want to get that, you know, fully-fledged 3D modeling environment, that's hard. So, um, but then on the other hand, you have um, obviously constraints being... Um, um, you know, tied to a desktop application, you gotta have the Rhino, um, um, you know, um, Rhino installed, and uh, there is a little bit of a process there. And we started to think about, like, um, you know, what what if we actually wanted to? Well, first of all, have the ability to just get access to essentially Rhino's modeling capabilities um, in a browser, essentially like going to the browser, typing up an address uh, or a domain get there, and then you have a 3D modeling environment. And um, I mean, we kind of attacked it from the angle of, um, OK, this is kind of a library. It's not necessarily a fully fledged product that's ready to go. It's more like, here is a piece of technology, um, and you can do pretty much whatever you want with it. Um, so we hacked together a little Rhino interface on the web, really. And the way that it works is you have um, Rhino running on a server. And um, typically what you do when you want to uh, visualize 3D models uh, on the web is like you send the entire 3D model uh, to the client. Uh, but here we actually wanted to try something different. Um, so what we did instead was just to essentially mirror the viewport that's, that was on the server, like in other words, the Rhino viewport, to a browser. So that was one component, just getting the, the stream uh, of... Um, Images, really. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. if you think about it, like a three D viewport is just an image, right? Mm -hmm. So we take that image, we send it to a um, uh, a web client, and then there is communication going the other way around uh, as well. Like from the browser, like you have all these like click events. Like if you if you now actually see the the thing in your browser, you want to be able to click on an object or like select something or maybe like draw something. So there is a stream of um, of uh, input data, really like flowing from the client to the server. Mm -hmm, so then you mm -hmm. have this relationship, like um, the 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 browser, the client provides a bunch of inputs, which then the um, viewport reacts on. And for every change in the viewport, you take that frame, really like the picture of the viewport, and then send it back to the the client. Um, so I mean, we we started to like sketch out a bunch of different ideas what you could do with this. Like you can like create a completely new interface for Rhino. I mean, we talked about like, what if you have disabilities, maybe you don't have any hands, like how would you do 3D modeling then? Like you can completely override all the, um, you know, typical um, uh, tooling you would see in a 3D modeling software. Um, or, 
you know, other ways, I think another idea, like how do you do 3D modeling for kids? Like, uh, you know, can you like mess around with bigger buttons? Can you like, you know, simplify the user interface a bit more? Like, Just like, like all these uh, different ideas. Tinkercad, I think. Was yeah, the yeah, product. Tinkercad, Tinker right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the idea of kind of simplifying an interface, right, in a tool that's been around for so long and just it keeps getting more and more complex over time, more buttons, more commands. And th because Rhino is a tool for lots of domains, not just architecture, right, there could be a way for you to just pick and choose commands that you want to enable somebody to use and not have to worry about 80% of them or 90% or 95% of them, right, and just say, with these simple, and this is what SketchUp did very successfully, right? It was just like, how do we dial it back into like eight tools <laughs> that, that can yeah. do most of what people need to do? And then they made the tool extensible so people could yeah. write plugins and do all kinds of other stuff, right? But the idea in the beginning was just like simplify, 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 because yeah. uh, as CAD technicians and 3D technicians with very robust tools, it was too overwhelming for most people, right? And so the idea of taking a tool that does exist, that has the richness and the depth and all, everything that you could possibly want and then simplifying a UI on top of that and doing it through the web browser and making it available no matter what device you have, it's a kind of an incredible feat that you guys pulled off at a hackathon, right? Like that's, that's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Evan. I mean, it was a really fun project. I think um, we had all the, the components there, really. Like, we had an idea of how we could implement it. We had kind of the pitch. I think that's that's super important to think about in a hackathon project. Like, how do we actually frame this? How, we, how do we present it? And, you know, what's the uh, value proposition here, et cetera? Um, and, um, you know, just starting to build out that case uh, in parallel you know, you, you work on the implementation and the uh, the tool development. Um, yeah. but And then just, you know, just have fun. That's that's also an extremely important aspect of uh, hackathons and you just, you know, allow yourself to experiment and mess around and, you know, fail and, you know, pick it up again and, and so forth. Yeah. This was the thing that originally enabled me to reach out to you was just seeing that. Like it was, I saw your post on LinkedIn about Rhino Anywhere and, and what, you guys had done and I thought oh I, I, we need to talk about this because <laughs> just we haven't broached the subject of of hackathons on the, on the podcast yet and so this is a great kind of introduction for people who haven't participated in those or people who have, have watched from the sidelines maybe for many years of why they might want to show up at one of these events and get involved because again like this this work that you guys pulled off is going to go back and it is going to initiate some other ideas in the work that you do in the office even i would assume like that you're you're inspiring people on the outside you're going to inspire yourselves you're going to inspire people on the inside and i that's kind of this magical thing of what hackathons and these symposiums and aec tech and other versions of that that exist out there can do for people and i think uh this is a really vital part of the aec industry and the aec tech community right to to build those relationships and then just hopefully keep that momentum going beyond this one event and this kind of initial proof of concept. It's like, yeah. well, maybe this has legs. Like what, so what kind of feedback have you gotten after showing that off even outside of the event? Cause obviously like social media posts after right. these events are, are everybody's watching them. So I'm sure you've gotten a lot of feedback. No, for sure. I mean, it's, uh, it's always interesting to see how people react to it and uh, you know what what kinds of conversations that get started just from mm. from seeing it i mean there was another year we um worked on a uh project called rest hopper which was mm. this was just by the time where rhino compute came out essentially the idea of you know hosting a um rhino process inside of a, inside of a web server and we ask ourselves uh can we run a grasshopper script as a backend, essentially. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so we did that for, um, you know, 24 hours. I think this was back in 2018 or something like that. Um, and yeah, we were able to develop a quick, dirty little prototype. I mean, it was extremely ugly, but it kind of proved the concept of like, okay, here we have a grasshopper definition. I think we had a typical, 
you know, twisted building kind of things. Like you provide some, uh, you know, <laughs> of some, course. yeah, always like you have the angle of rotation and all that. And, um, yeah. You know, again, using the the browser uh, kind of an, as an argument to you know democratize um, um, uh, the design process and just like opening up these kind of configurators and like um, systems to to um, to other people that are, might not be on a um, you know um, heavy heavy laptop with Rhino installed. Um, and um, yeah, we're able to build that prototype and. Um, uh, posted some some um, some videos on on the internet and uh, got some pretty good response and to the point we actually started to talk about making a solution out of it internally at TT. So sometimes that happens as well. Like you actually, mm-hmm. um, it actually it can turn out to to be a real real project sometimes and and um, uh, that's also quite fascinating to see. Like. Um, you know, sometimes it's more like an inspiration and, you know, a conversation starter, like, you know, pixel streaming, uh, which we used in, in the Rhino Anywhere hackathon project. That's been around for a long time, but not necessarily that much in the AEC industry. I mean, in, in, in right. gaming, it's quite common, right? It's like you you want to play some really um, intense, um, you know, first person shooter game on your shitty laptop, but... Um, and then, yeah, you essentially rent um, a server uh, or a computer um, and um, yeah, you get access to that power uh, of of, uh, of computes really, and then you can play these games. So um, and um, yeah, it's 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 just a way of like starting conversations and potentially even like work uh, continue the the, the projects. So either like if you do something in the office, or sometimes we see uh, projects kind of resurrect in other hackathons as well. Like you know, you kind of build on top of what's been developed yeah. uh, in previous hackathons. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a good conversation starter. That's cool. Well, let's talk about your other project that you've got going on, Model Up, and what, what that's about and why you, why that's something that you're pursuing as well. Because when I looked at your webpage, uh, I, one of the things that, I think it was in the About section, at model it's modelup.co, is that correct? Uh, it's, yeah. mo- hang on, it's modelup3d.com. Oh, okay. Modelup3d.com. So tell yeah. us about that project and, and what, what you're doing there. No, for sure. I mean, I think there is certainly a good link here to what we have discussed previously. So, I mean, it's really the idea of um, taking, you know, the intelligence of the extremely powerful, you know, parametric design tools that we work with. But I mean, in our context, we kind of have that encapsulated in, you know, our industry. So, well, we ask ourselves, like, what happens if you actually expose these um, type of tools in a dummified or simplified versions to a bigger audience? So that's what we do. We, we develop 3D configurators. Essentially, you know, you have a viewport where you see a 3D model, and then you have some controls um, to manipulate the 3D model. And mm-hmm. obviously extremely inspired by how Grasshopper works, Right, like you, you have sliders, you have, you know, buttons and you know toggles and all that, and you know, messing around with these parameters will update the model. Um, so, um, yeah, what we do, we we don't necessarily work with neither architects or engineers or um, you know people in the building industry. It's more about targeting kind of um, you know a lot of um, building products, more on the like home owner side or um yeah we have one company that we work with that produces um um kind of outdoor rooms like aluminum systems with with um glass really mm-hmm. um so um yeah we help them to build 3d configurators essentially and it's really you know kind of leveraging the computational design tools that we've been working on uh with uh, for for so long again kind of productizing something to productize something <laughs> right yeah. it's like no sort of yeah it's it's inception it's uh, <clears throat> i mean you're the whole idea of configurators again kind of new to AEC in that respect we we see i've seen it with shape diver as well maybe we can talk about the difference between what we're seeing with shape diver versus model up but the idea of giving somebody else outside of the organization access to a certain number of parameters and options and making it so that they can make decisions based yeah. on 
the inputs that you provide, I think is super interesting, right? And it and it gives a practice or a firm the ability to, I mean, drive interaction, include people yeah. in the decision making process, but also potentially productize a thing that they've. Yeah. I mean, the, the logic that goes into making that is your, I guess that's your IP at that point, right? And it, it becomes a thing, though, that yeah. with their decisions, they can send that information back to you. And y- you could probably tie costs and all kinds of things to that to, to automatically provide that information yeah. to them. But then you basically have a snapshot of their order, yeah. in, in quotes, right? And that becomes a, a, another avenue for you to produce a thing that people then purchase and it's another maybe a a business idea so no totally i mean exactly i think that's really it like the information like i think for us being um you know comfortable with 3d modeling and parametric design this Mm -hmm. is kind of basics right like for but for someone who has no idea how to use 3d modeling maybe doesn't even have a laptop um like being able to generate a you know, visualization of a kitchen or, you know, Mm -hmm. um, a do-it-yourself table or like all these things and like getting the drawings and, you know, bill of materials, it's magic. Like that's magic for them. Um, So, um, yeah, I think it's just really fascinating thinking about parametric design and like computational design and, you know, grasshopper logic and putting that sort of outside our industry uh, and, you know, see the value that that can provide is, is, uh, it's pretty immense. And, and they don't even need to know it's grasshopper. They don't need to no, know exactly. Any of they that. don't care. Yeah, yeah. exactly. They yeah. don't care about Who grasshopper. Yeah. yeah. They just want to build that <laughs> kitchen or like the, you know, the table or chair or whatever, like just give me the drawings, like tell me how much inf- like, um, material material I need to buy, et cetera. So it's, um, or place an order. I mean, yeah. Or right. place an order. Exactly. No, for if sure. you're going to, if you're going to do all that on your, on your end, that that's really a, a cool idea. And so, I mean, you've talked about a couple of, of ideas, like a chair or a table, like, well, give us an idea of the types of configurators that you've, you've built beyond, beyond furniture. Yeah. I mean, do we you have, have the few... Ikea kitchen generator? <laughs> do you, have you duplicated the well, Ikea I'm Swedish, website? Of course. Like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. I mean, I okay. Think... So where's the Volvo configurator? <laughs> the what Volvo else do we... <laughs> check. <laughs> yeah. What else? <laughs> Spotify configurator. Maybe. <laughs> right. Yeah. Music no, but, playlist uh, configurator. There you exactly. Go. Um, no, I mean, we have a few projects in the pipeline that I probably can't talk too much about at this stage, but it's, it's, um, it's kind of mainly targeting um, like the homeowners and home improvement markets. Nice. Um, and so that's really like one leg of what we do. So that's the kind of us building our own configurators that we, you know, release more of a B two C kind of setup. And then we have the other mm-hmm. uh, leg, which is the kind of more typical B two B. Like you know, we get in touch with. Um, companies, they describe their business and their production system, and we build 3D configurators for them. And um, that can be also twofold. Either they just want to present something for uh, their customers to, you know, increase sales or, you know, improve conversions or whatever. Um, Or it can be just automating internal processes related to production. Uh, and sometimes it's actually both even. Um, so, um, yeah, it just has a lot of potential when you actually get in to these, um, companies with the, you know, parametric design chops and you can, you know, actually build something. Well, you prototype, you can prototype it out quite quickly, right? Using, using Grasshopper. So mm-hmm. that's also like one of the, um, I guess, sales and marketing mechanisms that we've been using quite a lot, just like that ability to put stuff together on an afternoon. I mean, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's fascinating. And it's, um, yeah, people get impressed when they actually see their products in 3D configurable, you know, from, from that short amount of time. And, and maybe this is a bit of an aside, but my, my gears are turning in my brain with the new stuff that's coming out with Rhino 8, which has recently mm. been released, which is like in Grasshopper being able to reference in Rhino files, blocks, mm. having control over all of these different objects, all their la- knowing all their layers, knowing all their materials, and just like further extending the capabilities of 
I would guess, these configurators because now they can just, you can pull so much more rich information into them. Like you don't just have to define a curve or de- right. define a, you know, define this geometry or a, a surface or whatever, but it's like, wow, now you could have a library of mm. objects in their own files that you could then pull in and reference into this. And it's like a pretty incredible XREF kind of a system at this point, totally right? Yeah. Where, where these things, you, you bring a RIDO model in into Grasshopper so that you can spit it back out the other end. I mean, that's just, it's incredible. The possibilities are truly endless. Yeah. And so this, the extensibility of the system is just continues to, yeah. to blow me away of, of what these tools have made us capable yeah. of doing as, as users. So no, totally. I'm super, it, yeah. no, for sure. I'm, I'm super psyched about the whole uh, push around uh, Rhino 8 and how they, I mean, the McNeil people actually uh, are able to, uh, you know, build this out as well. Like, of course, like they have the core business. I, I talked to Brian from McNeil at, at, uh, at some point and he was describing like, um, you know, there is one type of Rhino users. They, they use Rhino. Um, and they do 3D modeling for different things. And then you have like the grasshopper and scripting folks, and it's actually quite different and must yeah. be quite hard to um, accommodate both of these audiences and, you know, making sure that both are happy. happy. But I mean, I, I obviously right. belong to the grasshopper and automation and Rhino common scripting audience, and I'm happy. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really good to see like all the cool things that are happening. I mean, as you mentioned with the, uh, the Rhino tab in in, um, in Grasshopper for for Rhino eight, and there is some other really nice um, um, yeah developments that's been released with with Rhino eight as well. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I think we've covered all the bases here. Is there anything else that we're missing that you wanted to put out there for the audience or chat about? No, I mean I think. Um, yeah, more hackathons. Come to hackathons and organize hackathons. I think it's just an amazing opportunity to, um, you know, network and get together, have fun, you know, hack on something, uh, dream a bit, actually implementing these dreams and, um, you know, mess around with new technology and tools and, and, and stuff like that. And there aren't actually that many that organizes um, hackathons in, in, in our industry. Um, I mean, there are a few, obviously, like Core Studio ATT being one of them, but um, it doesn't actually require that much. Um, well, I shouldn't say that because Dave, my colleague, would would hate me then. But uh, it's it's you know it's not like <laughs> organizing a conference where you need like you know a space mm-hmm. to sit in and you know like speakers and all that. It's more like you know a bunch of people show up um, and you hack on things. And yeah, it's it's just a fantastic format. And in general, just like you know building communities and making friends really so uh, i would encourage people to to do that you got to bring lots of extension cords and power strips and coffee <laughs> yeah, right? that's true and, yeah <laughs> it's, a, it's different than a, than a big conference but the, <laughs> yeah. but the, it's there are components that are necessary i just Absolutely. thinking about like the the advancements in just laptop computing in the last decade of what has been capable to be accomplished at a hackathon just because hardware has advanced so much is has got to be such a cool thing like the things that you guys can hack together in a day is incredible and you're doing it all on a very portable device it's just it's pretty neat to watch that happen yeah. no for sure and it's um yeah i think also the if i just look at the hackathons that we have hosted for you know um, a decade like the level of um outcomes has been uh just evolving dramatically like it's so impressive to see like how the bar is raised for every year and it's 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 really fascinating to to observe and it just continues to raise and and and, um yeah it's just a fascinating playful environment that i think is really really fun so who is not coming to these hackathons that should be i think that that's a good question to ask because i have an idea but i want you to answer that first because it seems to me like it's going to attract the usual suspects like they, you've built this community there's people who are definitely wired for this but who should be there who's not that's a good question i mean i think there is certainly a level of um zooming out a bit like i guess you can just like see your day-to-day work and just like grind on and uh, you know, maybe you're not too passionate about what you're doing. Maybe they should actually come. Uh, I mean, because mm. it's it's really like, you know, you actually get to do 
fun stuff and you know think about real problems from a kind of fun perspective um but um i mean obviously like depending on the location of course there can be some some uh, logistical components to it that can be tricky uh but um yeah so maybe maybe that what did you think of my idea is that leader firm leadership mm. who is I- interested in digital transformation or the capacity or the like like what it could do i think they would get so inspired going to a thing like that and just being an observer and walking around the tables and watching the passion for this because i think there's still a separation in in some firms that like that there's a digital team and that's that's what they're just part they're they're another team under the umbrella and the shift like i said earlier going from calling it digital practice or whatever you want to call it to practice is inevitable right and so the idea of like this it's not how we do it it's like I mean, it's hard. Tools are not a means to the end, but they are the only way that we actually get there nowadays, yeah. right? So, and so, it's it's interesting to me to to start to shift the conversation around. This is a our firm does digital. Our firm does sustainability, <laughs> and thinking about this as a menu of yeah. options check, versus check, like yeah. this is the way that we do things. And exactly. shifting that in leadership is extremely important for those leaders who are not. Uh, they don't have visibility into that because they're not seeing it maybe in their own firm or they don't know where to look or they don't they don't know who to ask. Going to a place like this would just I would I would think light an intense fire of of FOMO, right? Uh, <laughs> that to me would be it could be a catalyst then for change on many other levels in the industry that need it. Because of course you have this community that is super fired up about this stuff. And like you said, maybe it's even a reprieve from the day to day and it's something Mm -hmm. new and exciting and it'll light a fire and get them excited about why they do what they do. And on another level, we we need this industry wide, we need to address the adoption thing. And we need to address that, like raising all boats with the tide kind of a thing, not just unique firms who are willing to invest substantially into this kind of thing or individuals who are investing in themselves to bring these tools to their firm and it falling on deaf ears or whatever like so so to me it's like we just need more players in this and i feel like the grassroots level is there you're proving it ac Mm. tech is a grassroots level thing but and and thornton tomasetti with core studio is proving the other model exists too right top down because of the, that big investment, but we really need, I think we need a lot more of that because I think the grassroots side of it's covered, right? That students learn how to do this stuff in school. They go to a firm and the firm isn't using it, right? And so like you sought out a company that was kind of digital first. There are so many companies out there who are not and people are mm-hmm. trying to get tools into the door and they're going nowhere. And so to kind of flip that, I, I would say like the invitation needs to go out to firm leadership, it, not just CEOs, but mm. COOs yeah. and folks. and other people who are like th- their day to day, like CFOs, like CFOs want mm. to see innovation and change. Yeah. Like they're invested in their companies. And I, I actually see sometimes more passion from a chief financial officer than I do from a chief executive officer as far as innovation and cha- transforming the way that a firm works because they want to add value to their customers. They want more customers, right? They want more clients and they want to have they want to have an innovative architectural portfolio or engineering portfolio, right? And so they're also going to be a key person at the table who's making decisions about digital transformation in their company so anyway that's my my soapbox for, no, for the end of the episode I th- here i think you're totally right uh, i think you know the the top brass and and uh, more senior folks would really have fun at um at this kind of events and mm-hmm. i think it's also um i mean some people think of hackathons like you gotta know how to write code to participate meaningfully in in a hackathon and that's that's not true i mean there is so many aspects to hack project projects and and um um so yeah i mean even if you if you're a you know see see something c-level executive um and you don't know how to code like you can certainly like be there and you know, have a have a good time actually participating in projects, or just hang out. Like that's the other model. So, so yeah. for sure, I, I think you're absolutely right. 
I, I think that idea of kind of flipping the table of like a C level person is used to being the talker, the the decider, the one who is listened to. This flips the tables. Like you, if you go into an uh, environment like this where the experts are the ones driving the laptops, driving the technology, and just soak it up, just sponge yeah. it up. I mean, and and just like you said, just kind of go and relax and and watch what happens and. I think that would be an incredible opportunity to actually fade a little bit into the background and not have to be the one on stage performing and instead let the people who are really, really passionate about that and doing that thing be those people and you get to sit on the other side of the table for once. I think that could be, that could just feel really cathartic too. It's like, because then yeah. you can go back to your firm and you can enable that to happen yes. at, a, yeah. at, a, at the highest level um, and, 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 figure out ways to attract that talent to your firm uh, yeah. and figure out ways to get that culture going in your firm. I mean, that that to me is what leaders have to do uh, to yeah. be relevant in the future anyway, right? So this is a great place to kind of get infused with that in a very, in a very meaningful way in a very short period of time. No, for sure. I think, you know, you, you get impressed by how much you can accomplish in just 24 hours with, you know, um, good energy, like a good team, a clear mission. And um, so, I mean, we've had um, sort of internal innovation tournaments at TT. We don't call it hackathons, but um, so that's another way, like um, mm, just yeah. deciding, okay, for two days, we're just going to, you know, innovate or like, you know, have ideas tournaments and, you know, see where we can take it in, in you know, one or two days. So that's the other um, takeaway, I think, uh, that can be interesting that you get a kind of a sense for uh, when you attend a, a hackathon. I think that's really important is to actually separate innovation, in air quotes, yeah. from the day-to-day -day job. Because it's, I think there's an expectation on some level that innovation just happens, right? And it doesn't. It does not happen. It's like we're just trying to solve problems. Mm. There's no guarantee yeah. innovation, again, in air quotes, will happen. Um, and every company wants to say they're an innovative company and they're innovating with technology or in design or well, sustainability or whatever they, whatever it is, right? But to separate this thing out and have these tournaments and actually say like, okay, this is, we're not worried about billing to projects right now. No. We're, we're just interested in incubating ideas and the value of that process and stretching those muscles and getting that to be part of the culture that's a great way to do that. I absolutely agree that that's really that's really cool to hear that you do that internally as well in, in this tournament style. Yeah, no, for sure, it's it's fun. I mean, it's um, it's I think what I find fascinating, and as you said, like you always have a bunch of context in your daily work, right? Like you you work on this project, and you know these are the constraints. In hackathons, it's not really like that. It's it's more mm -hmm. like you're starting out from a blank piece of paper right so it's it's yeah. um that's really enabling i think um just like i can do whatever i want now blue <laughs> like, sky yeah right? blue sky like no no legacy code base to support here let's just go for it right right well very cool i i appreciate this conversation it's been really fun to talk to you emil so uh, i'm going to put links to hopefully everything that we've talked about uh, so we'll have Thornton Tomasetti, we'll have Core Studio, we'll have the Hackath AEC Tech Hackathon, we'll have modelup3d.com. Is there anywhere else that people can follow along with what you're doing? I'll, I'll put a link to your LinkedIn page as well, but um, I think I think that might cover it all. But if there's anything yeah. else, let me know. No, I think that's, that's perfect. I mean, I, I, I use Twitter and LinkedIn mostly, so yeah. Okay, great. Awesome. Well, thanks for this conversation. It's been great. Yeah, thank you so much, Ivan. Uh, pleasure to be here chatting with you.